I'm Doris Burton, a member of the Archives Committee. Today is September the 18th, 2013. We are in the Parish Hall in front of the De Burgos mural with Jan Hoffman. So, Jan, can you start by giving us a, a little bit about yourself, a little background for us? Uh, I've been at St. Mark since 1957, and I came here as a result of being a member of the Church of the Savior, where I met Vernon Dozier at that time. And the Church of the Savior at that point was a church where you came to and stayed for five years, supposedly, and take all their courses, and then you would go back to your own denomination with a different outlook on things. And uh, it no longer exists, but that's the way it started. And that's why Verna left in 55 and came to St. Mark's. And she came because she was teaching a course in the Episcopal Diocese here, and Bill Baxter was assigned to pick her up to take her to that class, so that's how she happened to come to St. Mark. She knew she was going to join the Episcopal Church, but she didn't know which one. So at the same time, Vera Pierce and I were at the Church of Savior, good friends of Verna's, and we started another church. We thought, well, this was the way to go, and we had bought a house up on up near the cathedral, and there were only 12 of us who left and did this, and the man who was our minister was a young man who just got out of seminary and he it, anyway it did not work you cannot duplicate what was already done so well <clears throat> and so that failed and so that time i came to st mark's and that was in must have been the fall of i think it was the fall of 1957. but there was another reason why you left virginia left Virginia because, this is before I got to St. Mark's, but in 1955, I lived in Virginia out off of Columbia Pike. And I'd been there for about seven years, and Vera Pierce and I shared an apartment there. And uh, this was a time when housing was very difficult to, to get any place to live, because it was after the war years. And so <clears throat> we were there, and Verna used to come and spend the third weekend of every month with us. Well, you know, people in Virginia had their cleaning people, but that was it. And we knew that things were, well, we could tell some looks that we got. Uh, but one night, we came home, and there was a notice plastered on our door giving us 50 days to get out of the apartment. We, with no reason, and right away, we knew what it was. <laughs> we felt that it was. So we did do a lot of things to try to find not necessarily to find out, but to do something. We didn't let anyone know, and we didn't want, well, we didn't want to talk to anyone there about it. That was the thing. So I went to see the manager of the apartment complex, and he was a nice guy, and he says, oh, I said, I really wish I could say more, but I can't say anything, because I'm sure it was sure that we were going to sue. That was the problem. And we went to see a minister of a Methodist church that we thought one of the women in this complex was the instigator. We never were sure. But uh, anyway, he said, oh, he said, if that's the case, he says, I'm not doing my job. So, because we thought he could have been racist for all we knew. <laughs> but he was wonderful. And then we did several other things. But uh, a young couple lived underneath us who just moved in. And I, we did not. They gave us 60 days. We were determined we were not going to move to the very 60th day. And we were going to move so no one could see us. So a lot of our friends who rented trucks, trucking them to move us, and they came at 4 in the morning, so <laughs> no one would see us go. But the night before, this couple came up to see us, and they just moved in. They were a young couple. I was, I guess, by that time, 55. I was in my early 30s, I guess, in my 30s. Um, and they said, um, oh, we just moved in, but if this is the case of what it's like here, we don't want to stay here. So we felt very supported by that. But anyway, these guys came at four in the morning and moved us out and moved us into the district. And so, which we always said to Verna, she did us a favor to get us. <laughs> so that's how, uh, that was in 55. And that, so that's why St. Mark's was very significant also, because Verna was already here. And so we came, when I came, it was so supportive, supported by the community. Say a little bit about Verna coming to St. Mark's, because I know there's, a, there's quite a story well, there's a lot that. of stories about her. Because mm -hmm. <clears throat> Bill Baxter had a way of exaggerating situations. <laughs> he was always, uh, 
he had a lot of gifts. But, uh, and Bruno liked him a lot. I mean, you know, he, as I said, he picked her up and took her to this class and said St. Mark's was ready for a black, which was not true. They were not ready for a black. Because there was a lot of the old people, the, the original people here. And so when she had, she had to appear before the vestry, and she always wore, she always tells the story, she always wore button-down dresses. She was so nervous. I think Vera brought her up here. And anyway, she forgot to button some of her dress, and she said, oh, Lord, they'll think the typical black person, you know. But the man who was senior warden, it was a man by the name of Bob Butter, and he was one of the old-timers and was also probably very prejudiced. But finally, as the discussion went on and on and on, he finally said, if Miss Dozier wants to join St. Mark's, there's no one that can stop her. And so anyway, that's what happened. And then in the years following, Vern and Bob became very good friends. And, you know, so that's how, but she had to appear before the vestry, so they get there okay. Was, so, there, was there some pushback from other vestry members that, that she talked about? I don't about? know that. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure. I, I don't know, because I'm not sure who all was on the vestry at that time. I think there were mostly those old-timer ones. And how was she received by the congregation? Well, that seemed fine. That seemed fine, because the congregation was so small, and it was a very liberal kind of group always, you know. So she had no problem with that. That wasn't a problem. Now, I don't know if anyone left or not as a result of her being there. Some of the old time they could have. There was one woman, um, Elizabeth Harrell, who did the paintings, you know, that she was a southern woman and was old. And she, one Sunday morning, we took communion at the high altar, and we were kneeling there at the high altar, and Elizabeth was next to Verna, and she told the story that she went home and threw up after being there, and then they became very good friends, <laughs> you know, too, once again. So it was, uh, but those were troubling days. What was um, the role that, that Verna played in the development of the Christian ed education program here? Um, she was not in favor of one kid, and she let it very well be known. And the reason she was, well, I don't know all her reasons, but one reason that she always stated was that a system that had the answers in teaching was the worst form of teaching. And she was an excellent teacher. And so she always was against it. Well, and it was interesting because Funk Ed was extremely important in those days. And everyone knew where Verna stood. She did not hold that back. And people would go to her, like Ann Craig went to her once and said, Verna, how else can you teach? Verna would tell her that she can't when you hold the answer as a teacher, that's terrible teaching. And so uh, Anne says, how else can you teach? And so it was, I don't know, I don't think she felt excluded because of that, however, because of who she was. Um, and she was pretty certain in her beliefs, very certain, you know. And so it, um, but she's, and you know, Penniman used to come down here and, because uh, I met him in those days, and she and Penham, of course, did not get along. And they would argue back and forth, you know, because you know, they held different positions. Now, Verna was a teacher in the public school system. She, she, she taught English in the public school system. Mm -hmm. so, so, if it was difficult for her, I can't say, because I don't think she acted as if it were, because she felt pretty, uh, she was pretty clear about her own position. Did she ever teach in the Christian Ed program? I don't, she, no. She never taught any, she never taught punk ed. She did a lot of lecturing, and like her book, The Dream of God, you know, uh, came out of uh, Advent lectures that she gave. And she did a lot of lecturing like that for, and she taught classes, uh, but there were never punk ed classes. She taught classes. So, because I took several classes that she took. To, taught. So, and then she became very involved in the diocese as well. Yes, yes. And that was always a sore point with Vern also because we were not very good about the diocese and we did not support them. 
And so uh, she was always fighting that battle you know, to get us to be a part of the diocese. Do you have any idea why we were, were so on the outs with the diocese? Well, I don't know. The only thing I know is that we didn't have any money. And that wasn't, that can't be the reason though. I think that we, St. Mark's was, uh, <laughs> in my opinion, was always pretty arrogant. And we always felt, in some ways, that we had some different ways of doing things and believing that other parishes didn't have it. We didn't feel that we needed the diocese. Mm -hmm. I think that was basically it. I don't think it was anything that was done to us or anything like that. Now, there may have been, I don't know, but as far as I know, that was the story. But Vern was always fighting that, always fighting it. <laughs> So she'd be happy to see that we're she much would. more involved today. And she'd be happy to know that Jim Steen was one who did an awful lot of getting us to support the diocese mm. again. So she'd be happy with that too. So. Well, let's go back to the 1950s when you yeah. first arrived at yes. St. Mark's and, and Verna was here. Mm -hmm. So you had a friend. Yes. Because and, there were several other people from the Church of the Savior that had come here. Okay, and can you talk a little bit about some of the, the things about St. Mark's in those years that attracted you, that made you want to be here, aside from having friends here, of course? That was basically it, oh. uh, because I knew nothing about um, the, well, I knew something about the Episcopal Church, but not, not that I was drawn to it. It wasn't that at all. Mm -hmm. But uh, it was basic. Basically that, and I'd heard about St. Mark's, and uh, and then once I came here, I certainly liked it because for one thing, it's a beautiful church, and there were many, and the people here were interesting, and I did have, there were, let's see, how many of us, two, four, about five of us came at one time from the Church of the Savior, and Bill was always so happy that we came because the Church of the Savior, you had to tithe. I mean, that was part of your commitment to the church. And so we all continued doing that. Well, Bill always was just amazed that we would be giving that kind of money to the church. But that was part of our commitment there. And so we had just kept that up then. So, but Betty Reed and Lou Lowe and who else? Anyway, there were about five of us who came at that same time. So it was, seemed a logical place to come to for that because I had no other church I was connected to, really. So shortly after you arrived here, the mural appeared. Right, right. And could you talk a little bit about those days when the mural was in process or when, when it was installed and dedicated? Now, Ralph de Burgess did not come to church here, the man who painted. His wife did, and his daughter. He had a little daughter, and they came. But the reason that the, I did not live on Capitol Hill, I lived where did I live at that time? Northwest Washington. But um, Bill Baxter was a great storyteller, and he told much about the conditions on Capitol Hill. And he, he would tell wonderful stories about, like, the old woman who's in one of the pictures there. He would tell stories, told a wonderful story about her and how, what it meant to get old and no community and how she eventually ended up in one room, just her kitchen, that's where her whole life was lived. And, but he had this very dramatic ways of telling these stories and what went on. And so that's, I think, why the mural is, is significant to people who were here at that time. Because the hill was not like it is today. It was really, it wasn't the greatest community to live in. I mean, you know, so it, uh, and St. Mark's was, you know, the ceiling was leaking, we had buckets around, always there catching the water, and, and it was, so it wasn't, uh, so I was just kind of, when the mural was done, I was just like, yeah, that's, that's the way it is on Capitol Hill. And so that's, that was why it seemed, not that it was a great piece of art, but that was, and it shows like St. Mark's there with just those few scattered people, well that was true, that's all there were, just a few scattered people. And of course, when I came, the pews were still there, too. And so it was uh, so a very different kind of church. Um, say a little bit about the disappearance of the, the pews. That's, that's a, it was a pretty dramatic decision. Made by Bill Baxter alone. <laughs> and how was that decision received? Well, by those who were new well. People, I mean, because Bill could talk you into anything because he could present situations so well of what it meant to, 
church, have a church in the round room, someplace that you looked at each other, and, you know, and, and he was uh, very persuasive, and we all agreed, thought it was wonderful, except uh, there were those who didn't, of course, you know, and there were some of the old parishioners who stayed on, and they had a hard time with what went on, you know, it was really hard, but uh, they stayed, and I don't recall a whole lot. We met, we met in the parish hall during that time, and uh, while the pews were being removed, uh huh, the pews were like when Johnson first came. The pews were there, and because um, <laughs> it was always fun to watch him because Johnson really loved pretty women, and. He'd go up the communion rail, I mean, he'd take communion, go up to the front there and come back. And then when people would go up, he'd, if you sat behind him, you know, and someone like Betty Foster, Trudy Keeler, these beautiful young women, he'd turn and watch them all the way back to their seats, you know. But anyway, he was here during that time, too. And, but he was also here when we took the pews out and we were meeting back here. So, um, but I... I think people were pretty excited about it. I don't think a lot of people felt that it was done very well, handled well, the decision. Some people had some problems with that, but Bill did what he wanted to do. <laughs> now, there was, um, there was also some controversy with uh, LBJ taking communion at St. Mark's. There was, in fact, there was a story on the front page of the paper about it, about him taking communion. <laughs> and yet communion was always open communion at St. Mark's. We, everyone took it. But it wasn't open across the board in other churches. That was pretty That's unusual. Right. That's day. right. It's true. That's very true. But there was a story in the Post about him doing that. So apparently it was a big issue. But he, no, he participated. Because one Sunday um, he was there and um, we were just kind of hanging around in the May before we came back here, and I was started to walk back, and he was there, and he grabbed me by the arm and said, um, he says, how long have you been here at St. Mark's? And I told him, and then he said, no. He says, do you like it a lot? I said, yes. He says, everyone seems to like it here. And so then he said, and where are you from? And I said, you mean originally? Or? And he says, originally, and I said, I'm from Ohio. And he says, I'm going there next week. And I said, so I read in the paper. And I said, where are you going? And he turned to the Secret Service guy and says, where am I going to be in Ohio next month? So he was very friendly. He was very friendly to people. And, and he and Lady Bird made some gifts to St. Mark's. Lady Bird gave the cherry trees out in the courtyard, and he gave some money for the air conditioning. Now, the story is that she pushed him to give the money for the she could have, have as far as I know because she was the one who was the one who was really here by choice I think you know and he came this well a lot of reason he came besides Lady Bird was Harry McPherson who was here and Harry was very close to that family he was one of Johnson's closest but one of his closest advisors so uh, I think that had something to do with it too but he came came fairly often, you know, it was always fun to see him, except after a while, um, you just knew that it wasn't going to be the same because the Secret Service wasn't anything like it is now, but they used to be in the Library of Congress Annex across the street, they'd be on the roof, you know, so that I know you'd be driving and say, oh, Johnson's coming today, <laughs> you know, because <laughs> it did change things, you know, that's the thing, but it was also fun. Now, what about some of the uh, events that went on at St. Mark's in those days? Uh, things that Bill arranged or scheduled to kind of excite the parish and energize the parish? Well, I suppose the major, one of the major things he did was starting the chancel drama. Hmm. That was probably one of his major things. And that was controversial, but that also, now that happened to be more, but I, it wasn't a diocesan affair, but there were other Episcopal churches involved in it. I think Bill was, I don't know if he was the leader, but certainly one of the leaders of it. Were they hill churches that, that no. were, uh -huh. they were all over uh -huh. the diocese? Uh-huh, uh -huh. all over the diocese. And so you did the play here, but then they rotated all around to the different churches. And Bill was, uh, now that was more controversial because he started out with, what was the first one they did? I think it was a Tennessee Williams play. Well, you know. Cocktail party? No. 
Uh, they did cocktail party. I think there was another one. What Mother that? Courage, Lost in the Stars. Well, they did those too. Mm -hmm. That's the only Courage, ones I Lost have. In the stars. But this mm -hmm. was the tendency of something. What was that? Monday is. I don't know. But anyway, they were controversial because, as Bill believed that you did right where we did. Uh, when we were in vagina, vagina monologues right up there on, in front of the altar. And that's where Bill believed, as he said, all of life takes place before the altar of God. And so that was hard for some people. Some people found that, especially with some of those plays. <laughs> you know, they weren't the, uh, what they would consider religious plays. <laughs> you know, they were much more realistic. And, but but that, those were exciting times, and a lot of people took part in those. What were some of the other things that went on that you thought were exciting for that time? Were there dinner dances yet, or was that a little bit later I before those got started? I don't any dinner dances in Bill's time. Um, we had, like we always would have, oh, we had Thanksgiving dinners here. Mm. We had, we did have dinners. That was one thing we did. But I don't I don't know how they were done. I guess they were all potluck mostly. They always were. And what else did we do? Nothing stands out offhand. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure there were things we did. Mm -hmm. but, uh, well, let's go back to Johnson for a minute. Um, one of the, the significant events in our history mm -hmm. is the fact that uh, LBJ and his family attended on the Sunday after the Kennedy assassination, and, and you that were present really that day. So could you say a little bit about what that day was like for you, mostly, of course, but for the congregation as well? Mm -hmm. um, of course, none of us knew he was going to be there. I mean, there, obviously, someone knew he was going to be there. I'm sure Bill knew and some others. Maybe the best we knew, I don't know. But uh, when I remember coming to church that Sunday, and I remember seeing some security guards. Not a lot, but there was, um, at the door, I used to come in the far door, and there was a couple of security guards standing there. No, no one stopped you or anything. It was just that you knew something was going to take place. And so it was, it was quite amazing when they came in. And, you know, I don't remember, I don't know, I guess his whole family was with him at that time. Really sure, but I think so. And Bill, the preaching was always done from the up in front of the altar there. Out of the one. And Bill came down from there and stood down in the midst of the congregation to preach that sermon because Johnson they sat in the front row, and he came down and like stood in front of where they were, and that's how he preached that sermon. Then, so it was a very somber day, and very, but it was. Uh, I think people really were very moved by the whole experience, you know, to think that Johnson was there. Was there more security that day than but usual? Not, it wasn't that much security. Yeah. It's amazing. Times yeah, were different. Times have, times have really times changed. Times were different. Mm -hmm. But there was some, maybe more than I realized, there could have been security guards sitting around there someplace, too. I don't know. Well, given that that, that was a, a, a pretty uh, uh, difficult time for the nation, Right. Uh, let's jump to another okay. difficult time for the nation, which was when Martin Luther King was assassinated and there were riots here in Washington, D.C. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. How did St. Mark's deal with that? I mean, we weren't, St. Mark's wasn't in the middle of it, certainly, but um, mm -hmm. 1968. Yeah. I don't remember. Isn't that interesting? I have no recollections of that. And it must. 68, and Jim was here Jim then. was here. Jim mm -hmm. was here. Isn't that funny? I don't remember. I don't recall anything. I mean, it was, I recall, the last things that I recall about that were the, the march. I mean, when people were, but I don't recall that Sunday right after he was killed. Well, let's go back to the march then. Do you, what, did St. Mark's in, in any way participate? Oh, yeah. In A lot of people marched. Mm. I did not march because I had just had surgery, and <clears throat> but a lot of people marched. And are you going to interview Mary Cooper? Mm -hmm. She knows a lot. She knows more than anyone, I think, of what went on. And Mary marched, I know, too. 
and I bet she would know that Sunday. But I don't recall that Sunday at all. Nothing at all. Were there any other times in St. Mark's history in those years, when in the, particularly the 60s and into the 70s, that, that were particularly significant for you? Is there any change that went on that, that you remember in particular? Let's see, I'm trying to think after Jim came, that would be too. That would have been 65? He came in 66. 66. Yeah, it was here in 96. Um, it was the year I was in, I served on the vestry in the 70s. But at that time, we were always in financial problems. I remember the four years I served on the vestry, we didn't talk about much else but money. We, it was a uh, very slow time for the church. And you know, St. Mark's never did have a lot of people. It started to, it started to get better under Jim. Jim really, I mean, Bill, Bill established a lot of what St. Mark's was to become. And Jim followed in those footsteps, but he was very well organized and he was, so that's when church, the church really started to grow more under Jim. Never had a lot of people though. And uh, never was crowded. I don't remember St. Mark's being crowded. Christmas and Easter. Yeah, always that. It was all those times was always crowded. Christmas Eve, in fact, Christmas Eve used to even be more crowded than it is now, but only probably because they have the four o'clock service that mm -hmm. so many people go to that. Mm -hmm. But because we used to get come here about an hour early to get a seat even, mm -hmm. so. But, uh, but it, I don't know, it just was a gradual process, and Jim was a gradual process. I mean, he changed so much during the time he was here, what he believed, too. And so as a result of that, there were more people who came, and more like it is today. Do you have any particularly fond memories of, of something that happened um, over the years at St. Mark's? Anything that stands out for you? Some changes, perhaps, that, that you think were very positive for the church? Well, a couple of things. One thing that I remember that I thought was wonderful, <clears throat> um, Verna was senior warden, and Jim was on sabbatical. She was in charge, there was no one else around. And it was the time that the Library of Congress wanted to take over St. Mark's, you know. And Verna had to fight that battle and testify and everything. And that's when we got our status of being a historical site. That's what saved the church. So that was very significant at that point. People were worried of what was going to happen. Did you attend any of those hearings? No, nope, I did not. We talked a little bit about the installation of the mural, but I know that the parish hall was, was renovated at least once, uh, mm -hmm. probably in the 70s, under Joe Turner. It could have been. I don't recall that. Okay. Is that right that you've heard that? Mm -hmm. uh, well, it's probably true. Um, yes, because it wasn't, well, I was trying to think when the bishop was here when we did this. 57, uh, we figured. That, yes, and that was, that was pretty crowded at that time, I remember. Quite a few people were here. And uh, and that was the bishop Angus Dunn, who was very he was a popular man. And I think St. Mark's liked him. I don't know when this all started in our that we were against the diocese, mm. but at that point, no, I've been here very long then. By that time, because I think he came in '54, I believe. And so, um, but the parish hall used to be. I was trying to recall what it was like. Um, all the Sunday school classes were in the parish hall, and they were just separated by those rolling screens that they had. And because I used to teach Sunday school, and it was just bedlam in here. Because you know, kids were wild and noisy. And, you know, it was, but that's all the space we had. Because the, for the Undercroft, you know, it was just we had a. The basement was down there, but there was only the pub was there, and it. Was Terrible. It was just an awful, awful room. And the other part was where uh, the deaf community's church was, and that looked fine because you could go in from that from the outdoors, but it was terrible. And so the undercrop was a big addition to really did help. As far, it helped with the number of kids that were here. That was one thing. 
But we always had pretty many, you know. Mm -hmm. it's, there's still those who grew up here, so in this church, like Bobby Smith and Elizabeth Long. I mean, they were little kids here, so, so they stuck around. <laughs> Um, anything else in particular that that you consider to be a really great memory from here at St. Mark's? And of course, Jim Steen came, and you were very you were very pleased about Jim coming when after like Jim, Jim retired. Because I do think he helped a lot. Can I you say how in what ways he helped? Sure. I always had the feeling. Now this is just my feelings, but uh, Jim Adams to me was not a caring, loving person individually and. He was much more of an organized man, and he did not, that was not his gift. And I always had the feeling, I mean, people loved Jim. Jim was quite popular, always. But I always had the feeling that Jim Steen was so popular because he showed a side that we had never seen at St. Mark's. Because Jim was so lovable and just so outgoing and so caring. And I always had the feeling that's why he was liked so much because people didn't realize what they missed. <laughs> At least that was my feeling. Interesting. So, and I thought, I thought he was a great addition to St. Mark's when he came. I thought he did his job well, and, that, um, and obviously people liked him. Jim and it, was, it had a positive impact on Jim. Yes, because he went on because he was not going to be in parish ministry anymore. And as he said, we gave him back his ministry. And which was a lovely gift from us. He gave us a gift and we gave him a gift and went on to greater things and did what he does best. So, so St. Mark's has done some good things. Now, you participated in the Vagina Monologues. <laughs> right. Would you like to. Along with you. <laughs> would, you, would you like to say a little bit about that experience from your perspective? Well, the first thing, I was startled to death to be asked to be on it. <laughs> and I thought, oh my gosh, you know, these are all much younger women. And I thought, they know this is just common language. And then to me, it was, you know, nothing. Well, I found out that wasn't quite the case. But anyway, so, um, and I don't know what made me say that I would do it. That's the thing that surprised me, because it's not anything that I would have done. So, um, but I would never give up that experience for anything because it was so wonderful being with the other women and uh, having Jack direct that. He was so good and it was just, uh, and it made it, that it was really delightful to do. I really, I loved that experience. I thought it was wonderful. Well, now you had, a, you had the, the role of um, <laughs> a person who had a dream, as I recall. Yes, yeah. Something in, it was about a car, wasn't it? Well, yeah, but it was, yeah, because of the woman who had gone out with a man in the car and, the, um, and all the things that happened to her that she wasn't used to and didn't understand or know about. And so, but it was, uh, and it was fun to see what happened as a result. I mean, like, when we first started with Jack, you know, and I've never been in plays or anything. And it was just amazing. I mean, Jack worked us hard, you know, as you remember. And, but it paid off, too. It was really different by the time we did that. And so that was a wonderful experience. Did, what kind of reaction did, did you personally get from, from friends here at St. Mark's or from other friends that came to see you? Yeah. Well, um, everything was very positive, and uh, people really loved it. I think people were surprised that I would be in it. I, that was one thing. But. Uh, who was, I was at a meeting last night at St. Mark's about what we're going to do for Advent lectures and things. I mean, Advent services, and um, oh, what's the young woman's name who was very active in the 20s and 30s? Katie Whalen? Yes, <laughs> was there. And she came over to me and she says, I don't know you, but she says, I know about you because I know you were in vagina monologues, and I've heard that from everyone. She says, I'm just sorry I wasn't here at the time. And I thought, no, isn't that interesting because that's been about Nine years ago, I think we did that, wasn't it? Mm -hmm. Well, I 2004? I think it was 2004. 2004? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, so that's nine years ago. Yeah. So, but I thought that was interesting that that's what someone said about me to her, you know, because that's what she'd heard. So it was fun. So it lives on. <laughs> now, we're just about ready to close this building down so that it can be renovated. <laughs> 
And so I think I want to conclude with some thoughts you might have about the future of St. Mark's. The building itself, how you feel about Vision 2020, and what happens next for St. Mark's? I think that, uh, of course, I think Vision 2020 has been handled so well. And I think the people, oh, so many of you have worked so hard and given so many hours. I'm, I'm so impressed with that. And I'm also impressed that people have come across with as much money as they have. I think that's quite, that says a lot for the leadership, though, too, a great deal. And um, my feeling is, I just wish they could, I, mean, I wish we could come up with enough that we could finish the job. That's the thing, because I, I just think that this is the time to do that. And even if we don't, if we don't get Undercroft here, I mean, under the parish hall, um, if we get it at least partially finished, that would be helpful. But I think it would be wonderful if we could do the whole thing and get that done. Because I think that that is our next step. And obviously, um, there are many more families now and young kids. And I think that's where the growth has got to come from, you know. And I, not the, all of us old ones were, and there are quite a few old people at St. Mark's now who won't be around that long. So, like myself. <laughs> well, I don't know about you, Jan. I think you're going to be here forever. <laughs> I don't think so, but it's nice to see what's going <laughs> on. <laughs> it's nice to be a part of, uh, to see what's happening anyway. I, so I'm glad I'm here for that. Well, we're glad that you're here for that, Thank too. You. <laughs> and I look forward to you being part of the, the celebration when we dedicate all the new space in oh, just about fun. a year. So. That'll be fun. It That'll will be, be fun. One. Yes. Yeah, because I think it's going to be an improvement to help us. And it's certainly going to be an improvement for the staff. I mean, they've had a rough time being in Baxter House all those years. And, was a very good place for them to be. Right. Yeah. And so it's going to be wonderful for them, too. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> well, thank you for You're your time welcome. today. This has been great fun. It's and we fun. really appreciate you good. going back in time and bringing back us in time. so many interesting tidbits about life here at St. Mark's. Good. Thank you. Thank you, Doris. <laughs>